welcome. Thousand Pine Points to Skeptical Jed. Was here first. Sorry, Derek. Hey, Gary Soup. I don't think I've seen you here before. Welcome. I got the Incredibles uh, tree decorations ready to go. Probably put up the tree on Thursday. Okay, so uh, I think a lot of people know who that guy is. Michael Lacona. He did a TED-style talk recently, and it's on his channel. This, uh, the link's in the description. And I would love to critique it in a special way. And that special way is to pretend Michael Lacona is saying what he's saying, but from the perspective of Mormonism. I've done this uh, a couple times in a few different videos, but I think it's really powerful. It's basically called The Outsider Test for Faith. And um, when you look at it from a different perspective, from an outsider's perspective, you kind of think, wow, do I really believe this sort of thing? So if you're a Christian watching, uh, pretend, pretend you're not a Christian for the next 30 or 45 minutes or so. Pretend you're not a Christian. And pretend you're hearing Michael Lacona speak for the very first time about the evidence for the resurrection. And then also pretend you're hearing what I'm about to say about Mormonism for the first time as well. And see if you can tell any difference between the two. So here we go, let's get started. It's only 10 minutes long. Um, I'll talk in between, make sure I got everything working. Let's go. So what I would like to do in the last couple of minutes here is I wanna give you some evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. What I wanna do is just, I'm not gonna go through my 700 page book. I'm gonna break this down and make it so simple that even a Southern Baptist can understand. Okay. <laughs> So even a Southern Baptist can understand. Um, I'm going to give you some evidence for the truth of Mormonism, and I'm going to keep it so simple that even an evangelical Reformed Calvinist can understand. Uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the best source that we have. Now, some would think the Gospels, right? Now, and, and the Gospels are great sources, I think. Um, it's like when you play cards. Sometimes it's like, we wish we had more cards. We wish the cards we had were better. Well, we've got to play the hand we've been dealt. And it's the same with historians. We wish we had more sources. We wish the sources we had were better. But we've got to play the hand we've been dealt. The sources we've been dealt. So what do we have? Four Gospels, okay. Let's take the traditional authorship that's been assigned from the early church, the, uh, from early on from last, for the first few centuries. See, but with Mormonism, we don't have to do this. Uh, we don't have to use any traditional authorship assigned centuries later from a guy named Eusebius, who refers to a guy named Papias, who we don't have any writings for, who says a guy named John, who we're not sure who it is, says a guy named Mark got his stuff from a guy named Peter. We don't have to have this con convoluted uh, trail of evidence. We have the main guy, Joseph Smith. Matthew and John were written by eyewitnesses, disciples of, the apostles, uh, disciples of Jesus. Mark was not a disciple of Jesus, but he got his information from Peter, the lead apostle. So if we're going to assign these like card values, we'd say Matthew and John were kings because they're eyewitnesses. And Mark, because he got his information from a king, he's a queen. And then we could say Luke, well, Luke, the first three verses of his gospel are a little ambiguous. It's hard to know whether he's saying he got his information from the eyewitnesses or those who knew the eyewitnesses. So at the best, he's a queen. At the worst, he's a jack. So even at very worst, if the early church fathers and Luke are correct here, then you've got two kings, a queen, and a jack. 
at the very worst. That's a pretty good hand, isn't it? Well, uh, it's a good hand, maybe, if those attestations are correct. But if they're not, at best, you have a hand of four deuces. But with Mormonism, we have a much better hand. We have Joseph Smith, who wrote it right there, right when it happened, or within a few months or a, few, a couple years. Uh, direct eyewitnesses who signed testimonies of what they saw. This is aces all around. But we got a better one. If we're looking for the best source out there, we got a better source than even the Gospels. Paul. And he's our ace. And the reason he's our ace is, number one, he was not a Christian at the time. He was a persecutor of the church. He was arresting Christians, imprisoning them, and, and consenting to their execution. And then one day he was out during his persecutory activities, and he had an experience. He said, the risen Jesus appeared to him. And it radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. Well, Mormonism also has an ace, um, and that's Joseph Smith. And like Paul, Joseph Smith had an, an amazing experience. And not only did an angel of the Lord appear to Joseph Smith, but Jesus himself. In fact, Paul ended up a few decades later being executed. He went through all kinds of persecution. He was in prison, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was whipped, he was shipwrecked, uh, experienced all sort of hardships, and then finally beheaded just outside of Rome. So he believed what he was saying. Well, Joseph Smith, just like Paul, he experienced many hardships, many persecutions, leading to his death by an angry mob. So just like Paul, Joseph Smith also believed what he was saying was true. Here's another thing that's interesting about him. Paul knew the Jerusalem apostles. Paul wrote 13 letters in, that are in the New Testament, seven of which are undisputedly written by Paul. One of those is Galatians. And in there, Paul says in chapter one that three years after his conversion, he went up to Jerusalem and he met with Peter, the lead apostle, and also saw James, the brother of Jesus. Now, when he says he met with Peter, the, English, or the Greek word he uses there is hysteresi. What English word do you think we get from that? History. You see, Paul was not one of Jesus' disciples during his ministry. Yes, and um, Paul didn't have to get his information secondhand. Actually, uh, Paul says that he got his information uh, through revelation and through visions, but a lot of people also think from other apostles of the time. But Joseph Smith, he got it directly uh, from the golden plates. He got it directly from the uh, angel Moroni and uh, from his visions of uh, Jesus and uh, God the Father. He, Of course, he'd heard about Jesus' teachings. He had to know something about him in order to oppose them, right? He may have even seen and heard Jesus on several occasions. They were up at all these festivals, Passover, all this, uh, in Jerusalem at the same time. He may have even been in the temple when Jesus overturned the tables. He may have been at the trial uh, before the high priest. We don't know. It's, you can't tell. But he knew something about Jesus. So I can imagine him getting with Peter and saying, Peter, hey, Pete, when you guys were together after Jesus had preached all day and you're sitting around the campfire, what kind of things was he saying to y'all? And look, I heard that he walked on water. Is that really true? Man, that would have been some cool conversations. Yeah, and I'm sure the followers of uh, Joseph Smith and Mormonism uh, asked each other, did, did Jesus actually appear to Joseph Smith? I bet you there were some cool conversations there. We spent 15 days with Peter getting the history of Jesus. And then in Galatians chapter 2, Paul says, 14 years later, he returns to Jerusalem and he gets before the pillars of the church, Peter, James, and John. So it's the second time that would be before Peter, before James, first time with John here. And he says he ran the gospel message he'd been preaching to the Gentiles to make sure he was preaching what they were preaching. And they came back, Paul says, they added nothing to what I had to say. They extended to me the right hand of fellowship. In 21st century English vernacular, fist bump, Paul. Good job, brother. Yeah, well, but Joseph Smith didn't have to confirm uh, his message with others. Uh, his translation came directly from God uh, on those golden plates. 
Um, Joseph Smith was a prophet just like all those other prophets in the Old Testament. <laughs> now, for all we know, Paul may have been lying. So we want to look for corroborating sources, and we get them. Did you know that some of Jesus' disciples had a, uh, uh, disciples themselves? Peter had one named Clement of Rome, and Clement places Paul on par with his mentor Peter and calls him the blessed Paul. John has a disciple named Polycarp. Now, some of you young folks in here, you're going to get married someday, you'll have kids. If you have a son, you're going to look for names. Just remember Polycarp. <laughs> Polycarp says that Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. Ah, so Polycarp, a disciple, says that, um, a disciple of a disciple, said that accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. Well, uh, that is the same in Mormonism. Uh, there's a guy named Oliver Cowdery who said Joseph Smith consistently translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. So if you're going to believe Polycarp, then I think you should believe Oliver Cowdery, however you say his name. And elsewhere in his letter to the Philippians, he quotes from Paul's letters and refers to them as part of the sacred scriptures. This is not the kind of things you say about Paul if he's teaching heresy or what, his ment what their mentors had said uh, if he was teaching different what they were. It is precisely the kind of things you'd expect to see from these guys if Paul was telling the truth when he said they certified that he was teaching what they were teaching. Bottom and what Oliver Cowdery said is what we'd expect if Joseph Smith was telling the truth and teaching the very words of God. We would not expect Cowdery to say what he said if Joseph Smith was teaching heresy. The line is, when we are reading Paul on the gospel message, we are also hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. Which means even if we didn't have the gospels, say the gospels didn't exist, we could still get to what Jesus' disciples were preaching through Paul. That's pretty cool stuff. But Mormonism didn't need any other translations for the Book of Mormon because Joseph Smith was already translating correctly the very words of God found on the golden plates. Well, that would be if Paul told us what his gospel was. Imagine if we found a lost letter of Paul and he said, hey, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you. Wow, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, we don't have to wait for that because we actually have one of those letters. It's called 1 Corinthians, and it was written less than 25 years after Jesus' crucifixion. Less than 25 years? That far out? Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon within months or maybe a couple years of finding the golden plates. That's far, far superior than the writings of Paul. And in chapter 15, he says, Now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel message I preached to you. And now we're going to get an outline of what, Je what Jesus' disciples and Paul were preaching, the gospel message. He says, I delivered to you what I also received. In other words, he's imparting to them oral tradition he'd received from the apostles. And here it is. He says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. And then he lists a number of those appearances to Peter, to the 12, to more than 500, to James, to all the apostles. And then Paul says, last of all, he appeared to me. Well, there's a, a list of Jesus' appearances. But I hate to tell you this, Michael Lacona, but um, Mormonism has that too. Joseph Smith himself saw the angel Moroni, and he saw Jesus and God the Father. Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery together saw Jesus and Elijah. And Cowdery, Harris, and Whitmer, they all saw the golden plates at the same time. And plus, there were eight separate witnesses who all saw the golden plates at once. That's pretty strong evidence, don't you think? Three individual appearances, three group appearances. The group appearances are significant because modern psychology informs us that hallucinations are not collective. They're not contagious. You can't have a group hallucination. Hallucinations are like dreams. They're in your mind. They have no external reality. I can't wake up my wife in the middle of the night and say, Honey, I'm in Maui. Go back to sleep. Join me in my dream and let's have a free vacation. <laughs> can't do that, right? Can't do that with a hallucination either. Yes, and Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery testified to both seeing Jesus and Elijah. That can't be a shared hallucination, can it? And yet there were three of these group appearances. Now... 
Paul says, whether I or they, the apostles, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. So I gotta wrap this up. Paul is our best source, why? He was hostile at the time of his conversion. He was an early source. He may be the earliest source of Christian literature that we have, earliest in the New Testament. He claims to be an eyewitness of the risen Jesus. He knew Jesus' disciples, and we know that they certified that he was teaching the same gospel messages as they were. And they were teaching the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and appearances to individuals and groups, to friend and foe alike. (laughs) That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that is pretty awesome. However, um, Mormonism has uh, some sources as well. The best source for Mormonism, the early source, which is Joseph Smith, is almost immediate. He... Joseph Smith claims to be an eyewitness of Jesus and the golden plates and meeting the angel Moroni, and he certified and translated that message on the golden plates. Boiling up down to three things. Jesus' disciples taught he was raised from the dead, therefore we know it wasn't a legend because it was there from the very beginning. We also know, number two, Jesus' disciples taught the risen Jesus appeared to individuals, groups, friend and foe, so we know they couldn't have been hallucinations, at least not all of them. The group ones weren't. And Paul, of course, he wasn't grieving over Jesus' death. He was glad Jesus was dead. And Jesus would have been the last person in the universe that uh, Paul would have expected to see or wanted to see, right? And third, Jesus' disciples were willing to suffer and die for their preaching, which means they probably weren't lying about it because liars make poor martyrs, don't they? Well, yeah, there's uh, three facts there for the resurrection of Jesus, but Mormonism has um, actually more facts than that. They have uh, four facts. Uh, Joseph Smith taught from the beginning. He was translating from the plates. That shows clearly it's not a legend. Joseph Smith's three witnesses, Harris, Cowdery, and Whitmer, at the same time saw the angel Moroni and the golden plates. Um, So it's not hallucinations. Third, Joseph Smith and his followers are willing to suffer and endure martyrdom for their preaching. So that means they're not lying, right, Dr. Lacona? And fourthly, Joseph Smith was an uneducated farm boy who could not have written the Book of Mormon on his own. That means it's not natural in origin. It's a miracle. So just from this little bit of information, when we look at it purely through the eyes of scientific history, The only hypothesis that works well to explain the data is Jesus' resurrection. Well, I would say the only hypothesis that works well to explain the data of Mormonism is that the angel Moroni, Jesus, and God the Father did indeed appear to Joseph Smith, showed him where the golden plates were, and he translated the word of God to the people of the Americas. What other explanation could there be? Now, I can just hear the evangelical Christians screaming at me right now <laughs> that this, what I just did is all nonsense because if you look at the Book of Mormon, there's contradictions, there's inconsistencies, it doesn't line up with the New Testament, and so that's proof that Mormonism is false. But to that I say that you're being like those atheistic skeptics. Just open your mind, be objective to the evidence. And if you really want to know more about Mormonism, all you have to do is find those adept Mormon apologists, and they will explain these things to you. They can harmonize all these inconsistencies and problems that you might have with the Book of Mormon. Don't be so close-minded. The evidence is far superior for Mormonism than it is for the resurrection of Jesus. We have real people, real places, sworn testimonies, things written down within days or months uh, of them happening. Why are you rejecting this? Why are you being so hyper-skeptical? I want to um, read some quotes from Dr. Lycona. And first of all, I want to thank uh, my buddy Troy for uh, helping me with some of the basic facts of uh, Mormonism. He was an ex, he, yeah, he was an ex-Mormon, still is an ex-Mormon. He was pretty high up in the Mormon church. And I also want to thank uh, my friends um, Camille and Cam for for, uh, giving me some quotes. But I actually think Dr. Lycona really does struggle with this stuff. And from his uh, book, The Resurrection of Jesus, written in 2010, or published in 2010, listen to some of these quotes. 
My desire is for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus to be confirmed, since it would provide further confirmation of my Christian beliefs. Now, that takes some guts to admit that. He's basically admitting confirmation bias, that he wants this to be true. I confess that my previous research was conducted more in the interest of confirming my faith and for use in apologetic presentations than being an open investigation in which I would follow the evidence where it would lead me. Well, if you reject the evidence I just presented for Mormonism, should you not, Dr. Lycona, reject the evidence for Christianity, the resurrection? Another quote, I have been able to experience what I believe was a neutral position for a number of brief periods. During these, I have been so uncertain of what I believe in terms of Jesus' resurrection that I prayed for God's guidance and continued patience if the Christianity I was now doubting is true. So what's he saying here? He's saying that in those moments of doubt, he goes into prayer mode. And to me, that's another form of confirmation bias, just like a Mormon would do. When they have doubts, they pray to God, Lord, show me that this is true. I also confess that each of those occasions of neutrality did not continue for longer than two months, and that it was not usually reasoning that brought me out of them, since I was saving the wane of hypotheses for the final chapter. He's talking about his book. But instead, it was a lack of conscious and sustained efforts on my part to be in a position as close to neutral as possible. In order, in, what he's saying here is in order to kind of keep the cognitive dissonance at a minimum, he had to just basically not think about it too much. Last quote. I am aware that should my research lead me to the conclusion that Jesus did not rise from the dead, I would be dismissed from my position and my employment would be terminated. And um, he already did get in trouble for saying that just one little part of the New Testament may not be historically true. And that's the, um, the dead coming out of the graves in Matthew 27. Okay, so that's all I had. Uh, I think the outsider test for faith is amazing. If, if you're a Christian listening and you can actually view your beliefs from an outsider's point of view, just like you were shaking your head in disgust and disbelief when you heard me talk about Mormonism just now. Please know that this is how outsiders view what you believe about the resurrection. We look at the evidence, at least most of us, that you cherish so, so deeply, and we shake our head and going, really? You believe that huge claim based on that evidence? And I think if you can just imagine yourself for a few minutes seeing the evidence for the resurrection like you see the evidence for Mormonism, it will become crystal clear very quickly. Really? You believe in Mormonism because Joseph Smith says he had a vision and found some golden plates? Really? Come on. You don't believe that, you Mormons, do you? Really? You believe Paul saw the actual Jesus on the road to Damascus? Really? Come on. You don't believe that, do you? Anyhow, that's what got me out of Christianity, was basically uh, viewing myself in the third person, trying to take an outsider's point of view. How do outsiders consider their own outsider belief? Uh... <laughs> I just answered that, Dean, by um, trying to find, like, for, for instance, Dean, take, take all the criticisms you have for Mormonism and just now apply it to Christianity. I mean, if you think about it, Dean, uh, some of the evidence for Mormonism is better than Christianity. We have people who actually signed an affidavit, sort of like a, testimony. Look it up. There's eight witnesses who, say, who sign a statement saying that they saw the golden plates. Are you saying this is a conspiracy and they're all lying? <laughs> now, they probably are. But just like Paul, like, at what point, this is, 
this is the reason why I think it's so difficult for Mormons to, to see the flimsiness of what they believe, and same with Christians with the resurrection, is that you have to at some point say, I don't care about heaven. Oof, that's blasphemy, right? I don't care about the love of living forever and seeing my dead loved ones and so forth. You have to put that aside for a second. And same goes with hell. Uh, I'm willing to risk going to hell. You almost have to put yourself in that mindset in order to see, the, see what I'm saying here. Because there's so much love for Jesus and so much fear from, from hell, for hell, that it just it clouds your thinking. It's like that mother who's been presented evidence that her son has committed a murder and she just rejects it. No, no, my son would never do such a thing. Until you can take all that love and fear off the table, can you see the evidence clearly, in my opinion? Brother John says, if God really cared about saving, why didn't Jesus appear to the Pharisees and Pontius Pilate? Good point, Brother John. Um, if I, I think that's an expectation that a lot of uh, uh, non-Christians have. Is If this is true, and if... God, Jesus, wanted people to believe in him, that he did what he did. That doesn't mean they have to follow him, but if they want to believe the core propositions, a good start would to have appeared to Pilate, appeared to some Chinese, uh, even, you know, basically appeared to everyone in the world. Um, well, not everyone, but, you know, people of power and importance, people, writers, historians of the time. Uh, that would have been a good start. The only one person that, according to the New Testament, that Jesus appeared to who wasn't already a believer was Paul, and that was in a vision uh, or revelation just like Joseph Smith. Cam says, I have a relevant clip for you. We'll send you in a minute. Okay, I'll vamp, Cam, I'll vamp. <laughs> Real Jingy says, they saw golden plates. They didn't see the golden plates. I have those safe, safely stored in the storage unit being watched by some real meth heads. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe there was uh, forged golden plates, right? Once a believer can take the outsider's point of view, I think it's over. I really do. And what I mean is, like, if they can really s pretend not to be a Christian and understand the, the reasons why what they view as evidence is not really evidence. If you're going to say the evidence of Paul is, is great, which is what, like, like, Kona doesn't even really use the Gospels anymore. He, you heard him. He basically said these are, like, face cards at best. But Paul's the ace. Um. And I agree with him that maybe not Paul's the ace, but I agree with him that Paul's the best evidence. But if you're going to believe Paul, then why aren't you believing Joseph Smith? If you're going to believe Paul saw Jesus, why don't you believe Joseph Smith saw Jesus? And, it, and, and again, if you're not taking the, the presuppos presuppositional view that the New Testament is correct to begin with, if you're taking the point of view of, Maybe the New Testament's true, maybe it's not. Maybe Mormonism's true, maybe it's not. Then all those frictions between the Book of Mormon and the Bible go away because you can't say, oh, because the Book of Mormon says something different than the Bible, therefore the Book of Mormon's wrong. No, you can't say that anymore. You, could, you, you have to be open to saying, maybe the Book of Mormon's correct and the Bible's wrong. Maybe the Bible's wrong and the Book of Mormon's right. James, the brother of Jesus, wasn't... Um, <laughs> I wouldn't consider him an uh, enemy of Jesus. But I know that's what the apologists tell you, Dean. Sorry, was that a little rude? That would be too much evidence, Doug. We need evidence, but only just enough. Yeah, I don't understand that. Um, some people say too much evidence would take away from free will, but that's not true. Even the demons, they know for certain, right, that Jesus exists and is God, but they don't follow him. Oh, I better check my, uh, my Facebook to see if 
This is always dangerous. Ken's going to send me a clip, and I don't know what it is. I don't have it yet, Cam. I don't see it. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to get it here. No pressure. Oh, I just got it. I got to preview it first, Cam. Oh, this one? Yeah. Uh, Cam, this is 22 minutes long. <laughs> I don't know if I want to play all this. Uh, from the starting points about the bad aspects of atheism for our loved ones, the lust. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, I'll play a little bit of it. Okay, so this is a clip. I'm just going to play. Uh, there's no visuals. It's just uh, from a podcast. This is why... Uh, Mike Lacona, let me get a better picture of Mike here, so while you're hearing the audio, you can see him. Here we go. Oh, start from where you sent it? Uh, uh, Timestamp 1010. What the heck? 10 minutes, 10 seconds. There we go. 1650. <laughs> Okay, Cam. Right there. Okay. What if the far left were just unopposed? What would happen in our culture? It's because that people who aren't on the far left oppose them and present and promote a different view that the far left does not get its way. You notice he's talking immediately of far left. Basically, I, I get this picture that if you're far left, you can't be an ev evangelical Christian. And he could be almost right. Although I would say liberal Christians are on the far left. But the danger is not just from the far left. It's also from the far right. At least most of the time. However, it's the far left and the far right that actually make changes in society as well. We're people. We are all different and... Uh, we're all, our viewpoints are all needed in order to, um, to survive. And I'd say the same thing applies to why we should have Christian apologetics. If Christian apologetics was not given, if everybody was just silent on it and the evidence weren't provided, then people would go off to school. They'd go off, you know, kids, parents would send their kids off to these secular universities and the professors would get up and say, my objective this semester is to destroy your faith. And nobody would be responding to it. Think of okay, and why is that bad? I asked that question so many times. So he's saying if we, if we don't have apologetics, kids would just go to school, they'll hear from the professors, and they'll start to doubt. But so what? Why is that bad? What would happen in terms of the exodus of believers? But because of Christian apologetics, um, Christians are strengthened in their faith. They remain in the faith. Some of them go into full-time Christian ministry. And it impacts our society in a real way, because Christianity isn't just this fairy tale that is uh, only reserved for a few anti-intellectuals. And Mormonism is just not a fairy tale reserved for a few anti-intellectuals, uh, right? It involves intellectuals, and they present it because it's true. And we can know it's true. Here are some reasons it's true. It presents an alternative to, say, atheism and the hopelessness that comes along with atheism. Because what if atheism is true? You don't believe Christianity or embrace religion because of it makes you feel better. At least that shouldn't be the reason. You don't? Are you sure, Mike Lacona, you don't embrace Christianity because it makes you feel better? But you think about if atheism is true. Wow, that means when our parents, our spouses, our children, our loved ones die, we're never going to see them again. They just perish. They be You're never going to see your loved ones again. They just perish. Does that make, how does that make you feel, Michael Lacona? How does that make you feel? You don't like that feeling, do you? Maybe this is why you cling onto Christianity, because of the opposite feeling. You do want to see your loved ones when you die. You do want to live forever. It's this whole idea of eternal life is why you're a Christian, I think. It's not because of the evidence. Become worm food, and <laughs> the person they were just becomes entirely forgotten that the evil people, the wicked, get away with things. The righteous 
Okay, now he's talking about justice, not only living forever, but if there's no sense of ultimate justice, um, that brings a bad existential angst in you, right, Michael Lacona? There's, by the way, I tweeted Michael Lacona out on this. There's a small chance he's listening right now. And if you are listening, you're welcome to come on my show. But I'm just keeping it real here. I, I honestly think it is these feelings that are guiding you to see the evidence as you see it. There's a part of you that just, you said it yourself, if atheism is true, oh, I, can just, I can just see you just sign with despair, like worm food, no justice. What's, where's the justice in someone raping your daughter, Dr. Lycona, and then on his deathbed, accepting Jesus Christ as his personal savior. In fact, raping until that point. Your daughter and all the rape victims will be spending eternity with the, with the rapist? Is that justice? Like, the justice system in Christianity is not the best either. And the innocent suffer by these wicked people, and there is no reckoning. There's no justice that's done. Now, that is just, that, that's just a terrible thought. It's a terrible thought to you, and Christianity is a wonderful thought to you. Do you think these wonderful thoughts is what in, is impacting how you view the evidence, just like it would for a Mormon? And it, but if it's true, we need to live with it, or at least commit suicide and die with it. You know, such depressing thoughts. But mm. if, if atheism is true, it is a sad state of affairs. But if Christianity is true... It is a very, very good state of affairs, and and it is how if Christianity is true, I understand why you think it's a good set of, um, set of affairs. But you have children, Doctor Lycona. What if one or two of them die and are not Christians? Are you still going to say that that Christianity is a great uh, set of affairs? That it's a great moral view, a good uh, a worldview to have? Could you possibly enjoy heaven knowing that your daughter or son is in this place called hell, which I've been told is very, very bad? Like, think about what you're saying here. It is true. Why? Because we've got good evidence. We can know it's true because we have good evidence to support it. That's what Christian apologetics is all about. Even if it's good evidence, which I disagree with, the claim is huge. The claim is that a man rose from the dead after three days, walked on water, turned water into wine. The claim is that this man happened to be God. The claim is that um, all the teachings of this man are from God and therefore true. You can accept that God exists. You can even accept some form of eternal justice and still reject Christianity. You can still, here's your out, Michael. I have a feeling you're looking for an out. Here's your out. Be some type of um, nuanced deist, I guess, where you have this concept of eternal life and justice, but you can still say that the evidence for Christianity does not rise to a level to warrant the claim. I think you know this, Dr. Lacona. I think deep down you know this is true. I think you can hear what I said about comparing with Mormonism and say, yeah, do I believe Paul just because he said it? Really? Come on. It helps the, the seeker. It helps the believer. It, it demolishes the false arguments of those who won't accept the gospel message. And it has, as you're uh, describing here, this impact on society uh, where... Yeah. We're going even now from just these intellectual issues to these are real applicable ideas that have consequences for how we live our lives, for the justices, how uh, you know, and injustices in our society. How we yeah. See, this is another big part. Um, someone tell me what the interviewer's name is. I sh I recognize his voice. I know. Um, but anyhow, the interviewer is bringing up another point. This is the, um, the two biggest reasons why Christians are Christians, in my opinion. Number one, it's the whole idea of eternal life, either the love for heaven or the fear of hell. And number two, 
is this belief that if Christianity goes away, especially in the United States, because this is where these people are from, where I'm from, that the United States will just fall into moral decay. Oh, there's going to be so many abortions if people leave Christianity. Oh, there's going to be so many murders. Oh, there's all these social justice warrior, uh, transgender, all blah, blah, blah stuff will happen. Um, no, that's not true. <laughs> um, abortion's been falling as Christianity's been falling with it. Uh, violence in general in the United States, rates have gone down. Uh, just because there's um, homosexuality in the United States doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be worse weather. Like, seriously. And as far as postmodernism and all that sort of stuff, just because um, you're not a Christian doesn't mean you espouse those things. In fact, there's probably a lot of things politically that people who are not Christians agree with you, Dr. Lycona, agree with you, Mr. or Mrs. Evangelical Christian. There's probably a lot of things I agree with you on politically and so forth. So just, just because someone leaves Christianity doesn't mean they're, they're going to do all these awful things or believe all these awful things and support all these awful politicians and so forth. They might support still the same politicians you do. Who knows? I'm not sure how much more of this will create our laws, et cetera. There's this ripple effect um, that occurs when we do apologetics. And you know what, Kurt? I, I heard William Lane Craig just a few years ago. He was being interviewed by Lee Strobel, and Bill said that it's an exciting time to be involved in Christian apologetics and that we have entered, we have now entered into a golden era of Christian apologetics. So it's an exciting time to be discussing these things with you. Let's hope. Uh, I'm a, gold, a golden era of ap apologetics. I support apologetic, apologetics. I think the more information, the better. I, th I beg Christians to delve deep into these issues, into the evidence. But I think if they delve deep and really understand the outsider's point of view, in other words, why some people don't view the evidence as great as Dr. Lycona or other apologists. Once they understand why the evidence might not be that great, I think more people are going to leave Christianity. I really do. And I think that there's evidence to support that. I think the evidence apologetics has gone up in the last 10 years as Christianity has gone down. Now, for some Christians, they don't care about that. They, they think that's just cleaning out the chaff uh, culling the herd, uh, well, so be it, if that's your viewpoint. Okay, I think that's enough of that. Gold, <laughs> frozen sea. Nice comment. I have learned most apologetics are special pleading. Yes, I agree, Craig. I think, um, in fact, if you watch the first hour or half an hour of this video, uh, most of the Christians' response to why what I said about Mormonism doesn't apply will be special pleading. But uh, Christians, listen, listen to me here. There are apologists in Mormonism, and they sound a lot like the apologists out of evangelical Christianity. Well, folks, that's all I had. Hope you enjoyed it. I did. Thanksgiving's coming up. If you're an atheist, who do you thank? Think about that one, you dirty atheist. But it, spend some good quality quality time with your uh, with your family. We will see you next time.